Hi everyone, great to see you. And um, the title of my talk today is They Who Laugh Last Laugh Best. And this is an expression you're probably all familiar with. He who laughs last laughs best. That's a tongue twister. And it's a saying that means the final winner will have more glory than someone who was winning at the beginning but ultimately loses. So as we increasingly recognize the impact machines and artificial intelligences have on our lives, many of us feel threatened by their superseding us. And so will they have the, laugh, the last laugh? <laughs> but that begs the question, can they laugh? Can they understand humor? So today I will discuss divergent opinions on the feasibility of joke-telling robots and comedic AI from humor being the final frontier in developing empathetic artificial intelligence to comedy as the ultimate Turing test for distinguishing humans from machines. In a nutshell, in the article Teaching Artificial Intelligence Humor, William Wire uses the phrase, in a nutshell, to explain how fluid human language is and how it can change over time or with context. For example, in a nutshell, could either mean in a few words, or it could be the edible kernel found inside the hard casing of a type of fruit. So for humans, making this distinction isn't very difficult. But for AIs, this can be daunting. So in a nutshell, these are the images. Oh, uh, of course, I should go to the clicker so you see what I'm talking about in a nutshell. Um, in a nutshell, these are the uh, images that are based on or representing the topics that I'll cover today. Quickly, all right. Since the fourth century BCE, humans have been creating automata and speculating on the possibility of artificial life. However, in 1861, a new line of inquiry emerged. Can artificial life be funny? And so when G.R. Smith released Comic Electric Telegraph, and this was on display at the Great Exhibition of London, again in 1861. And it was through magnetic induction that he was able to create this mechanical face with this range of lifelike comical expressions. <laughs> and 130 years later, instead of the machine performing as human, we see in Mr. Zed the human performing as a machine. Anton Giholt, in his essay, Stand Up Com Comedy and Humor by Robots, discusses the history of humans performing as robots. So Mr. Zeb, we're going to see him perform in a second, performed by comedian David Kirk Trailer in the late 80s and throughout the 90s, embodies this idea of robot humor. And so Giholt says, when human performers on stage or in movies display robot-like behavior, they have choppy and mechanical movements. And it's interesting, these robotic-like performances induce laughter in humans. <laughs> Whoa, that's Hello, funny. I'm Zed, prototype of the ZX line and the future. I'm stand-up comedy. <laughs> well, what kind of audience do we have here this evening? Anyone on a first date? <laughs> Good! I could watch more of that, but to finish in 10 minutes. And so we see this again in Star Trek's Next Generation when Commander Data, um, a very developed artificial intelligence, fictional, okay, but he, I was a big fan. He seeks help from biological alien Guinan and also from the ship's computer to understand what humor is. And Data learns about jokes, but when he tries to deliver them like a human, no one really laughs. And then robots have found themselves, or at least what they represent, literally the butt of jokes. For example, in this satirical work, again from the 90s and early 2000s, by Japanese artist Momoyo Tomitsu. She crafted lifelike businessmen robots to crawl on city streets across the world. <laughs> These comical performances are a criticism of global corporate culture. And she dresses in this nurse outfit and often would pull down their pants uh, to change their batteries. <laughs> so from robot scatological humor to Futurama's hilarious bender 
to social robotic experiments, to AI stand-up comedy, funny machines seem to be leaving the domain of fiction. Today, research is being conducted on the feasibility of encoding into AI an authentic human or humor, human humor feature. So Heather Knight is a social roboticist who created Data, the first stand-up robotic comedian. And she thinks a lot about how humans interact with each other and then how we can design some of those principles into our machines. Knight doesn't want to replace humans, but she is interested in replacing computers with more social interfaces. And so in 2012, she began putting robots on stage. And here's an example of data. Social intelligence is so complex that many humans are not good at it. Any programmers or engineers in the house? And then the software Any in the house? Learning, um, is this uh, ability to use its vision data and its audio data. Um, it has uh, four different uh, microphones around its head, so you could start to look at where the sound is coming from and also look process the signal itself to see if this is laughter, this is like the volume of the applause. According to my feedback data, you are a wonderful crowd, and I am really glad you are here for me, because I think I might be about to break up with my programmer. Oh boy, okay. And then there's Lolbot. From the company's promotional material, quote, robots are taking over the world and artificial intelligence is taking giant leaps towards becoming more human-like than we ever thought possible. But there is one frontier, AI is yet to master comedy. And so they launched the 2017 Melbourne International Comedy Festival with Lobot. I am Lobot, it's nice to meet you. Lobot is amazing at riffing as well, so like this is a really great opportunity. So if anyone's got any topics, just yell them out. Yeah. Well, okay, I heard global, global warming. I have been programmed to operate in temperatures in excess of 90 degrees Celsius. But you guys are. Ha 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 ha. But laugh out loud, Lobot was ultimately fake. A quote from art director of the project, Giles Watson. After we fooled people into believing we had created the world's first stand-up comedian, comedic robot, we revealed that it was being powered by seven of Australia's top comedians. This was all done backstage. And on their website, they proclaim, nothing is funnier than the real thing. Then in 2017, also in 2017, Wired released a video where journalist Brent Rose uh, collected jokes from several different, different digital assistants, and then he performed the jokes in front of a live audience at a really popular stand-up uh, comedic place. And the mission was to find out which AI assistant was funniest. This experiment validated his general feeling that none of these devices out of the box are really that funny. Siri uh, actually didn't do very well at this time, and then it was Amazon's Alexa and then Google Assistant and Cortana that fared the best. So there are a plethora of debates going on right now regarding the teachability of humor to a machine. The dream of computational humorists is to crack the code for humor, believing that levity can go a long way in improving our relationship with technology. There are others, however, who see that teaching AI humor, if not possible or not impossible, could be really dangerous. Like imagining bad AI could start killing uh, people and just because they think it's funny. Science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke and creator of HAL from the Space Odyssey series responded to an interviewer in 1997 when he was asked, how about a Clark test for computer consciousness? And he said, I'll tell you what, if a machine showed a really genuine sense of humor, then I'd decide it was conscious. That could be a really good test. It would have to be able to make jokes and make jokes at its own expense. And Noam Slalom, a former comedy writer and current researcher at IBM Hoffa Research Labs agreed. 
We know that humor, at least good humor, relies on nuance and on timing. And these are very hard to decipher for an automatic system. That's why humor may be the ultimate Turing test. And then in terms of my own artistic forays into the field of speculating on machine humor, I have created fictional AI embodiments like Lady Ava Interface to the left, an AI assistant who took over the Whitney's website in the morning and at uh, sunset, sunrise and sunset. Uh, last year, and then there's my AI alter ego, Lucille Trackball, who jokes about tech ageism, AI servitude, and robot love. So, he looked around and saw the deflated principal. The principal looked at him and said, well, lad, you let me down, you let the school down, but worst of all, you let yourself down. I always add a laugh track, and it's a much longer joke, so you don't really get the joke, but I wanted to show some of her physical uh, comedy. All right. And in case you didn't get the reference, Lucille Trackball. So to, to finish up, inspired by the paintings of 15th century artist Giuseppe Archimbaldo, who pointed out humans' relationship to nature in his uncanny hybridized portraits, I'm pointing to the symbols of our new nature, digital semiotics. Beyond silicon and sleek minimalist design, we today compose our thoughts, feelings, and gestures in what? Emoji. So why not skin our future machines in a reflection of that? I am also fascinated with how we may relate to and interact with emerging intelligences. Perhaps there will be a day when the Wizard of Oz metaphor no longer is pervasive, when the intelligences seeded by we humans really become autonomous and can laugh and joke with us. Along the way, I hope that we can maintain a critical sense of humor about it all. In the words of Lucille Trackball, I love human music. The one problem is I've got a lot of al algorithm, but no soul. Wow. <laughs> Thanks a lot.